Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. When we read Paul's argument in chapter 10 of Romans, or for that matter, the entire section of Romans 9 through 11, we're seeing Paul struggling to put in perspective the catastrophic failure of the Jews to apprehend that for which they have been apprehended. Part of the challenge of setting forth the gospel in the first century was to try to explain what Christ had been doing and to explain how Christ was right and the entire Jewish establishment was wrong. Notice that in all of Paul's writings, there are no dire predictions that the Jewish state will be irrevocably destroyed when the kingdom of God is transferred to the Gentiles. And that's because Paul did not entirely understand what the short-term outcome for the Jews would be. For that matter, he did not entirely understand the short-term outcome for the Jerusalem Christian Church, which under James was determined, no matter how awkward, to synthesize the law of Moses with the law of Christ. It was not until Matthew was written, shortly after the publication of Romans, perhaps, that the fateful prophecy was published, Jerusalem would be destroyed. There would be no stone left upon another. The destruction of Jerusalem would be so complete that it would be compared to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which it was indeed compared to. If Paul had known this, I believe that Romans 9 through 11 would have never been written. And we would have never known Paul's own tortured departure from the land and from the religion that he once loved. Because of Romans 9 through 11, the parallel between Paul and Moses is complete. Paul must make the same kind of exodus that Moses made. Moses had to relinquish his Egyptian heritage, his Egyptian stepmother, whom he no doubt loved and his Egyptian father, whom he no doubt would have followed into service. But Moses eventually left all to follow Christ through a baptism of death to all that had gone before, through an impossible crossing of the Red Sea into a wilderness of wandering to find his destiny. And so did Paul. And if we miss this part of the story, we cannot understand the example that Paul has given us about how hard it is to leave one's native homeland in order to follow Christ. Because the world, after all, is so full of a number of things that we should all be as happy as kings. But we are not. And that's because every baptized Christian must make an exodus from his native homeland to follow Christ. Having been buried with Christ in his baptism, he is bound to follow Christ into the unknown wilderness of God's will and not fulfill the longings of the flesh. We must lay aside our worldly crowns. It is a hard thing to do. If it were an easy thing to do, our religion would be just another radical, pathological cult like so many other religions of the world. These religions renounce the world as if it were dirty, the suicide bombers are making a religious statement as they kill other people and also themselves. Their acts of pathological violence say, this world is junk. I damn it to hell with this last act of violent repudiation. But the Christian's repudiation of this world is not like this. It is like watching Paul letting go of his whole beloved world that he might be found worthy to partake of another. It is like the old world pilgrims who left tearfully the comforts of their own homeland to make a dangerous crossing to find their destiny of freedom in the new world. At every step of our spiritual growth, we find ourselves turning loose our earthly loves. And this is a hard thing to do. The Lord knows it is a hard thing to do. And that's why the, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane was told. It proves that Christ understood how hard it was. To know God is to release our death grip upon the fears and fantasies and falsehoods about our present world, to renounce the vain glory and pomp of this world, and to let go of our dearest desires of our own hearts. The desires of Paul's heart was for the salvation of those who would not be saved his friends, and his own family, his associates, his peers, his teachers, 
They were all slipping away into a memory that could not be recovered. Just before, in the same epistle, Paul confesses his feelings about this. I wished that I myself were accused and accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, my race. All the translations, the KJV, the NKJV, the NIV, the RSV, uh, they, they all translate it the same. For I could wish that I myself were accursed. The Jerusalem Bible, which is a dynamic translation, plays with it a bit and changes it to, I would be willing to be condemned. It just makes a poor translation worse. There is no could in the Greek. It's just the past tense. The imperfect tense, as it is called in the Greek, it means just this. I wished I myself accursed to be. And I, I think what happened was it was a translator's attempt to cover for Paul's weakness. But why cover for Paul's weakness when it is through Paul's weaknesses that the strength of God's truth is revealed to us? Paul is admitting what he has gone through and what he is still going through. And if we do not understand this, we will miss the main point of Paul's life. Paul is saying goodbye to the whole world, just as Moses said goodbye to his. Moses wanted to take his Egyptian heritage with him. He wanted to synthesize the two religious streams of thinking. That's why his original plan was only to go a mere three days journey into the wilderness. Moses wasn't lying. He envisioned himself as coming back, but he wasn't coming. God's plan was for him to leave his Egyptian heritage behind, and so he did. Moses certainly could have wished to be accursed from God rather than leave his step parents behind, but God didn't grant that prayer, nor did God grant the prayer of Christ. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Christ did not say, I could wish that this cup would pass from me. Christ had to drink the cup of death. When we're at our best, we could long that our loved ones could be saved, whether from death or from hell, by offering up ourselves in their place. Paul once said in this epistle, for scarcely for a righteous man one would die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul so longed for his religious heritage to be true. He would have died to save them, but his death would not make them true. And this is what Paul was finding out. God did not honor his prayer and curse him, because only Christ can die to make men righteous, not man. Paul was finding out that Israel had turned its back on God one too many times and there was nothing more that Paul could do to help them. Now it was time for Paul to face the fact that he must leave on an exodus to a new world without them, just as Moses himself had to do. Israel had spurned God's love, and now the divorce decree was permanent. Paul was trying to understand what had happened, and the more he thought about it, the less surprising and disappointing the whole story became. Had not Jesus chosen Judas, even though he knew that it would be he that would betray him to death? Was any of this not foreseen by the prophets? Did not the psalmist predict that this is the way it must be? For it was not an enemy that reproached me, that I could have borne it, the psalmist said. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was you, a man mine equal, my guide, mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked under the house of God in company. And again the psalmist says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Could it be that the entire project of Israel could have been conceived by God, knowing that this would be its end? Could it have been foreknown 
Could anyone look at the facts of the case and not come to the conclusion that Israel had been chosen for its stubbornness and not for anything else but this? When we look at Romans 9 through 11, this is what we are seeing. Paul is reviewing the facts of the case, mostly for himself, but he knows that there are others that are struggling with the same thing. A terrible, terrible thing must happen in the life of every Jew. He must leave his Judaism behind. If he is to follow God in an exodus out into the wilderness, he must leave his Judaism behind. And the longer that Paul refuses to see this, the longer he subjects his own people to the confusion and the spiritual danger of two mutually exclusive religious ideas. The Judaizers insisted that faith must be conjoined with the observance of the Mosaic Law, that nothing had changed, but everything had changed. For Christ, Paul says, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. But the Jews had rejected the righteousness of God that had finally been achieved. In the very act of crucifying Christ, they had said, if this is your righteousness, we don't want it. And so, their foolish mind had become darkened, and they established their own righteousness, Paul said. And the worst part of it was, is that Israel should have known. Paul asks, did not Israel know? Yes, they should have known. It should not have been a surprise. Paul quotes Isaiah. But to Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. They became pawns in the hands of God in the saving of the Gentiles, because, like Pharaoh, they hardened their hearts and refused their messianic role to the nations. Thus Paul quotes Isaiah again. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. And because Paul took the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles, the Jews became envious. Paul says that the prophecy concerning the salvation of the Gentiles, despite the jealousy of the Jews, goes back to Moses himself. First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Paul even quotes the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel of faith had arrived. Isaiah had seen it. Moses had seen it. Joel had seen it. And all the prophets had seen it. But Israel wasn't listening. And that's why St. Stephen preached his faithful sermon you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so did ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which have showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye now have become his betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept. Paul stood by, just as the Jews stood by, and watched the messianic role of Stephen come to pass. And now, in the 10th chapter of Romans, we are beginning to see that Paul himself has now accepted that messianic role, and that's why he thought that he must be accursed from Christ and die. Instead, by his messianic role to the Gentile world, he died not for the Jews, his kinsmen according to the flesh, but by their hands. He died like all prophets and all reformers to save the entire world, to save us. And that 